That rule of thumb you've been following makes no sense whatsoever. If you look on the forums or on Facebook, everywhere you look, people are going to tell you that the correct way to determine the cross-section area of your port is to multiply the internal airspace of the enclosure in cubic feet by some magic number to figure out the size of the port opening in square inches. I've been digging into it a bit, and I think I know what's going on, so I'm going to show you how I design ports. That starts with understanding the goal, which is a port that will not degrade the sound quality. When you build a ported enclosure, you tune that port to a specific frequency. This is called the box frequency or FB. At the tuning frequency, the majority of the sound is produced by the air in the port and the subwoofers themselves will barely move. You can put your hand over the port and you'll feel air moving in out of the port. It seems counterintuitive if you'd think that when the subwoofers are moving a lot that you would get more air moving in out of the port. But that's how it works, so more on that later on in the video. And that's not me saying it, that is how it works according to Vance Dickinson who wrote the loudspeaker design cookbook. He said that virtually all of the acoustic power is radiated by the vent at the tuning frequency. The word vent and the word port mean the same thing, I tend to swap back and forth between the words. So if the vent is doing all the work at FB, if the vent's too small, you'll lose output. Dickinson provides two formulas that you can use to find the minimum vent diameter. Both assume a round vent, but it's not hard to do a little math and convert the vent diameter to square inches. And oh, by the way, stop calling round vents like this aeroports. This is not an aeroport, it's just a round port. But if you grab a flange like this and attach a flange with a flared end to both ends of the port, then it's an aero port. If it's just a tube with no flare, it's just a round port. Okay, back to the formulas. This is the ing bretson formula, which states that as the tuning frequency increases, the vent diameter gets smaller. The other formula is the small formula, named after small from the field small parameters. This one shows that as the tuning frequency increases, the vent gets larger, which is the opposite of the other formula, and that seems kind of weird to me, but eh, whatever. The important part is that both formulas show that as VD goes up, the port opening has to get bigger. So what is VD? V VD is the volume displaced by the cone movement. It is the X max multiplied by the surface area of the cone. X max is the maximum outward cone movement without creating distortion. The fancy word for cone movement is excursion, so bigger drivers require bigger vents, and drivers with more excursion require bigger vents. You may have heard people say that cone area is king. It's not displacement is king. Cone area is just one part of displacement. And the thing I want you to notice is neither of these formulas include anything related to the size of the enclosure. I'll say it again. The volume of your box is not a part of the calculation. The calculation is based solely on how much air the subwoofer can displace. More on that in a bit. Now these two formulas come from peer-reviewed scientific publications. They're really old. They're from like back in the 70s. They've been well vetted and they should be reliable. The key word here is should. And what Dickinson does, instead of just taking their word for it, he ran a bunch of tests and he concluded that both formulas yield vents that are too small. He went on to state that almost no realizable tubular vent operates in a completely linear fashion and practically all realizable vents compromise performance at higher power levels. Okay, what does that mean? That means that as the power increases, the port performs worse in practically every measurable way, which can be solved by making the port cross-sectional area larger. But as the port cross-section gets larger, the port port length has to go up. As the port length goes up, it gets increasingly difficult to actually fit the port inside the enclosure. So what do you do? Well, Dickinson recommends that for high-powered applications such as speakers designed for stage performance, it's desirable to use vent areas as nearly equal to the driver area as possible. And not once does Dickinson mention anything about the size of the enclosure. The issue is the amount of air in the port and how much that air moves. And that's a function of how much air the subwoofer can move. The relevant variables in this case are things like cone area, X max, and power handling. So where does this rule of thumb come from? I'll talk about that after I show you my preferred way to calculate the vent cross section. What I like to do is use a piece of software called WinISD. I go into WinISD, I load the subwoofer into the software. I spend a little bit of time tinkering with the tuning frequency and the box size so I get a transfer function that I like. After I got the transfer function that I like, what I'll do is I'll jump over here to this drop down menu and choose rear port air velocity. My goal here is to keep the rear port air velocity below 17 meters per second. That's 5% of the speed of sound. 
So anything below 5%, we call that the green zone. Anything from 5% up to 10%, we're gonna call that the yellow zone. You definitely don't wanna go over 34 meters per second. That is in the red zone. You're gonna get chuffing and your subwoofer box is gonna sound bad. Now there is another rule of thumb that says if you attach some flares to both ends of your port that you can double those speeds. Whenever you can, always flare your port. At the very least, grab a roundover bit and put a roundover on your ports. That's gonna cut down on the turbulence and give you a cleaner airflow and lower the chances of getting chuffing. All right, so back to Win ISD. It looks like everything is just fine because our port airspeed velocity is 1.8 meters per second squared. So we're down in the green zone. But this is with one watt of power. What we need to do is go to signal and increase that up to the amount of power we're playing on throwing at the subwoofer. I'm going to type in 600 watts. I typically use 80% of the RMS power. I do that to account for impedance rise and power factor. Keep watching. I will explain those two things to you a little bit later on in the video. So up in here in the corner, it tells us the airspeed velocity. Now we have 46 meters per second, and that is not going to work. That is in the red zone. It's going to cause chuffing. It's going to sound bad. So we go back over to vents, and we're going to try to make the vent a little bit bigger. We'll go from a one-inch wide vent to a two-inch wide vent. And what I want you to notice is that when we do that, the vent length jumps up to almost 22 inches. So here's an example of what that might look like in SketchUp. The box is 15 inches deep and 28 and a half inches long. This box is it's easy to build, it's easy to fit the port inside the enclosure. But we are still in the yellow zone. If we want to get down to the green zone, we got to make that port opening a little bit wider and see what happens. And that gets us to 15 meters per second. That's good news. We're going to have a nice, clean sounding box with no chuffing. But the vent length jumped up to almost 34 inches, and we can see that in this enclosure right here. Again, it's not really a problem. We can fit this vent inside the enclosure, but it had to make the enclosure a little bit larger. The first enclosure was 28 and a half inches wide, this one's 30 inches wide. I had to add more airspace to the enclosure because the vent is now larger and takes up more airspace. This box right here with the two inch wide vent, the vent itself is taking up just over a half a cubic feet of airspace inside the enclosure. So now the net volume of the enclosure is three cubic feet instead of the 2.5 we started off with. And we still haven't taken into account the space taken up by the subwoofer, the bracer, the materials on the external wall. When we jump over here to the three inch wide vent, this vent takes up 1.1 cubic feet inside the enclosure. So now our 2.5 cubic foot net enclosure is already up to 3.6 cubic feet. It's going to take up more space inside of the car. And in my experience, the space inside of the car is typically the limiting factor. Well, what if we want a bigger, beefier, more powerful subwoofer? We can jump up to this Savard High Q12, the big brother of the Savard Rap 12. In order to get down into the green zone, it needs to be four inches wide. And when we do that, look what happens. It's over 40 inches long. Why is that? This is a 1500 watt subwoofer subwoofer with an entire inch of one-way excursion. As the power and excursion goes up, you need a bigger port. Let's talk about that rule of thumb. I don't know where it came from, but I was chatting with my friend Blake. This is Blake here at Slamology with his golf cart stunt wall. He works for DD Audio and said that DD had done extensive testing to determine that rule of thumb. They use a rule of thumb of 16 to 1. So let's take a look at their website and see what they say. On this page here, they use one of their subwoofers as an example and they say that this subwoofer in their specific example can motorize the air mass in a port that is up to 67% of its size without any massive effects on power handling around the tuning frequency of the port. In other words, they don't recommend the port area based on the Vox volume. They recommend the port area based on the subwoofer. The website then goes on to say, we can look back at our ports and determine how big the enclosure needs to be. Did you notice that? Everyone's using the rule of thumb backwards. The box size does not determine the port cross-sectional area. They're using the port cross-section to determine the size of the enclosure, and they're using the subwoofer to decide how big the port opening needs to be. Now, I know that a ton of people watching this video right now are down in the comments typing like mad, telling me they've been using this rule of thumb and it works great. Let's talk about why this rule of thumb seems to work just fine. So if we pop back into WinISD and start cranking up the box size, we can see that the airspeed velocity starts to go up. So there does seem to be some type of physical connection between the box size and the port airspeed velocity. But where's it coming from? Well, to see what's going on, all you have to do is hit this drop down menu and select cone excursion. This shows you how much the cone moves. Look what happens to the cone excursion as the box size goes up. The cone excursion increases. The air in the box is going to act like a spring. And as the box volume increases, that spring gets weaker. As that spring gets weaker, the subwoofer 
can move more. So that increase in port airspeed velocity is actually due to the increase in excursion. So there is some merit to the idea that a bigger box needs a bigger port cross section. What we're observing is ultimately a function of the cone excursion. So what does that mean for you when you're designing your own enclosure? Well, let's talk about it. First, you only need big ports if you're running big subwoofers. Here's an example. This is an entry level 12 inch subwoofer from Massive Audio. It's a 300 watt RMS subwoofer. I think it has seven millimeters of X max. The undersized ports found on most prefab enclosures are going to work fine for a subwoofer like this. You don't need a giant port for a small low power subwoofer. Second, when you design an enclosure, make the port as large as possible. Your space limitations might make the best possible port unworkable. In that case, you need to compromise sound quality to make it fit or just go with a smaller, less powerful system. But where's the fun in that? Third, there's a spurious correlation between box size and port size. As the subwoofer displacement goes up, either due to increasing the X-Max or the cone area, the subwoofer itself tends to perform better in a larger box. And as the displacement goes up, the subwoofer needs a bigger port. So you have these two variables, the box size and the port cross section area that are both being driven by a third variable displacement. And that gives the appearance of a relationship between the size of the enclosure and the port cross sectional area. And that does mean that as you make the box bigger, you do need to scale up the port cross section. Fourth, it's easier to fit a big port into a big box. You see, as the box gets bigger, the port needs to get shorter to maintain the same tuning frequency. That's going to give you the wiggle room you need to scale up the port size. To learn more about how that works, click right here. To learn about amplifier power factor, click right down here. Before I go, I need to say thank you to all of my patrons and channel members and give a big shout out to my $25 and up patrons, Johnny, Timothy, Jonathan, JD America, and Bo. I'm Justin, this is the DIY Audio Guy YouTube channel, and I will see you on the next adventure.